Our scriptural meditation comes from both the Old Testament and New Testament lessons from the Psalm, the 22nd Psalm, beginning with verse 1, are those haunting words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by everyone, despised by all the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Likewise, in the Gospel of Mark or Matthew, chapter 27, hear these words as well, words of hope. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they cried, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. In the book, Silence, by Japanese writer Shusako Indu, he tells the story of a 17th century Portuguese missionary named Rodriguez, who goes to Japan to evangelize the lost. To prepare for that work, he spends lots of time trying to fixate his mind on the face of Christ and the qualities he longs so desperately for in his own life. Courage, wisdom, faith. But his, the images hardly offer him guidance or consolation. For as he arrives in Japan, he encounters a national uprising against Christians. He's soon thrown into prison in order to renounce his faith. From his cell, all he hears are the cries of his fellow prisoners and a strange snuffling sound that he mistakenly guesses is the snoring of the guards. Again, yanked from his cell in order to renounce his faith, 
he finds that the perceived snores were not that at all, but instead the labored breathing of Japanese Christians who have been crucified upside down, their heads half buried in pits of human dung. They will hang that way, warn the guards, until Rodriguez denounces his faith. Will he betray Christ or the Christians? The guards bring a metal image of Christ into the room and place it at Rodriguez's feet. Trample it, they order. The image is crushed already, soiled by the feet of those who have gone before him. It bears no resemblance to the bright, shiny image he had imprinted into his mind and heart in his prayers for courage, wisdom, and faith in the days before he traveled to Japan. But suddenly, he hears the voice of Christ, trample, trample, I, more than anyone, know the pain in your foot. Trample. I was to be trampled by humankind. This is why I was born into the world. Trample. So Rodriguez tramples the image, and the Christians are released. But the silence of God had been broken. Christ speaks not from the safety of a crystal cathedral, but from the depth of God's intimate understanding of human suffering. Jesus knows what it feels like to be abandoned. Jesus understands the silent agony of a God who will seem not to answer back. The world had turned their back on Jesus. After all, he had been labeled a common criminal. To many, he was but an outlaw who seemed to think that his understanding of things was superior to the law for those within the church. They had heard him make outlandish claims in the name of their God. He refused to root out the bad guys. And whether the bad guys were those in the highest levels of government or the corrupt ones in the church, you may as well brand Jesus as too passive to do anyone any good. So Jesus should be put to death. It suited the Romans since it would pacify the Jews and keep them quiet. It suited the priest who Rome held responsible for these uprisings in the first place. Kill the troublemaker and the trouble would go away. Judas bugs out. Peter plays dumb, and the rest are nowhere to be seen either. And to top it off, God, dear old dad, is MIA as well. Can you say abandoned? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you rejected me? God, why have you abandoned me? Such a painful question from the depths of life and the brink of death. And the answer? There was no answer. Only silence. And I know that in your life and mine, 
we too have faced those times in which we have felt abandoned. Walking away from a graveyard, we feel abandoned. Leaving a broken marriage with our hearts in our throat, once we get past the agony of broken promises, there's only the silence of our lostness. Sitting beside the bed of 12-year-old Jason, a Jewish boy, dying of cancer, whose parents did not even come to the hospital when he breathed his last. I wondered how abandoned he felt. There were no words, only silence. Maybe that's why we say such awkward things beside a casket. She looks so natural. He's in a better place. Because silence forces us to see our own lostness, our own incompleteness. My God, my God, why have you abandoned? <clears throat> It'd be so much easier to skip forward to Sunday, to the sunrise trumpet, to the Easter lilies, to the breakfast casseroles, and the colored eggs. But Jesus could not do that, and neither can we. He hung on a cross in silence and in agony, and so was, must we. And it is from the depths of our agonizing abandonment that we remember Jesus was here too. Jesus understands. Jesus knows how desperate we feel. Jesus wonders if all is lost. That is as far as we are allowed to go today to go further, to peek ahead, would be to minimize the incredible often, off, off, awfulness of this day. Whatever comes next, we must remain here in this terrible mess. We can only know that from the depths of our hurt, from the agony of our fear and the, our debilitating pain, our only help is to know that God was here too. Nothing we can do or say in this state can shock God. Nothing we can feel or think will make God turn away. When we say, where are you God? I'm all alone. Remember, Jesus said it first. Jesus died talking to his papa, who would not talk back. Christianity is the only world religion that offers a God who suffers in silence. This isn't a popular idea, even among Christians. We prefer a God, a God who nukes the bad guys. But that isn't the God we have. What the cross teaches us is that God's power doesn't end human pain, but instead gives us the power to sit in silence and to somehow know that God is here too. Not from a distant, but close up, intimate and personal. If that is the only hope we can take from this moment, let it be so. May God help us, and may God stay busy with us 
who are in grievous need for God. Amen. Seven, please remain seated.
your cross, O Christ, we see your incredible love. In your death, O Lord, we discover your irrepressible life. In your suffering, O Savior, we find that we are saved. Christ of the cross, see our need of your grace. Hear our prayer for your mercy and come to us again to help and restore. Because we cannot heal ourselves, we cannot save ourselves. We are lost in our own abandonment. We pray for more than agonizing silence. Be, o, be our God, O God, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.